Um, all right, you guys should be at Pitt's Strategy for Victory. Pitt's Strategy for Victory. Yes, correct. Um, and here's the list. You can double check. All right, are you guys there? Pitt's Strategy for Victory. Oh, yeah, we're the red checks. All right. So, did you get, we, we left off with the start of the French and Indian War in America last class, and that would be uh, Washington marching on what is present-day Pittsburgh, and it not going so well. He and his group of um, 150 Virginia militiamen with some Native American scouts are going to um, attack the, the French, um, one of the Native leaders, uh, bashes in the head of the French captain. It doesn't go so well. The French will surround Washington and his men at the um, at Fort Necessity. They'll surrender. Washington marches back, but the war has begun. We talked about the Battle of Great Meadows. This is where um, the British were um, surrounded and defeated um, in a battle that not only uh, caused a great deal of casualties, but also led to the death of Edward Braddock, the British field commander um, in the French and Indian War. And from 1750 or 17, sorry, 1755 to 1757, there is going to be a string of very uh, difficult uh, British defeats and fear that the British might actually lose this war. So the new prime minister, William Pitt, the, the great commoner, and another nickname of his was the um, organizer of victory, will, um, will decide to not only send in fresh soldiers to the, to the cause, but also send in some uh, new and, and young daring commanders to lead not only British regular soldiers but also colonial militia and Native American allies. Y'all remember what was the major main Native American tribe that allied with the British and the colonists? The Iroquois. Very good. Nice job. And remember that the the tribe that that um, was the largest tribe that allied with the French was the Huron. Um, so here's some of the changes that Pitt makes in 1757. He, again, sends in a large number of, of troops and commanders. He wants to move major assaults toward the French West Indies. What, what a valuable resource would the French want to protect in the West Indies? Uh, Excellent, their sugar, right? So. These are going to be naval assaults, some amphibious water-to-land assaults, and um, this is going to, to sort of sap um, and entrench the British in the Caribbean, allowing for new chain of, and, or channels of supply to reach the colonies um, from, the, from the Caribbean. Pitt wants to focus on that theater of war that we talked about from Appalachia, the Adirondacks, and into the St. Lawrence Seaway. He wants to take major forts um, that they had failed to take early on in the war, and he wants to take major um, French trading posts and cities along the St. Lawrence because that controlled the supply routes along the St. Lawrence. So those specifically would be um, Quebec and Montreal. Um, older officers are going to be replaced with younger, more daring officers, as I previously mentioned. In 1758, a major turning point will be the fall again, yet again, of Fort uh, Louisbourg, or Louisbourg, or it looks like it says Louisbourg, but it's Louisbourg, named for um, King Louis. Uh, it fell to the British again. Remember, that is one of those 
uh, island fortresses that guarded the um, Gulf of St. Lawrence. This will in turn block supply lines into New France along the Cabot Strait uh, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence into the St. Lawrence Seaway. We took a look at um, took a look at a map of that before and we'll see another map of that here momentarily. The British will go on to successfully take Fort Duquesne. Fort Duquesne will be renamed what? Not Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> it's a great guess, but not, not Fort Lauderdale. Hey, you threw a fort out there. I can get with that. That's cool. Fort Pitt. Fort Pitt, which will become known as Pittsburgh. So that's where Pittsburgh gets its name. Fort Duquesne will be renamed Fort Pitt. Fort Ticonderoga, are you all familiar with Ticonderoga? It's a pencil. Okay, it is a, it's an excellent pencil. It is a Cadillac of pencils. But it is also a fantastic fortress that sits on the border of present day New York, Vermont, and Canada. Fort Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga is going to be really important when we start getting into the uh, early events of the American Revolution. What's up? Yeah. So France and England gets it, and then the and then the Green Mountain Boys are going to uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys will take it from the British at the start of the revolution. That's cool. Um, in fact, that might be a good topic for you to research on the next go round. Um, James Wolfe, this is the, well, not just James Wolfe, also Jeffrey Amherst, who we'll talk a little bit about later, but James Wolfe was one of the key commanders um, in the French and Indian War, one of the new commanders, 32 years old, dashing, attentive to detail, commanded the army um, at the Battle of Quebec, boldly scaled the cliff walls um, that protected Quebec and met French soldiers on the plains of Abraham, where both he and the French commander, Marquis de Montcalm, will both be mortally wounded in the battle. Um, France will surrender Quebec a year later um, at, following the Battle of Quebec. Montreal will fall to the British, and the war will wage on, or sorry, rage on, and continue for several more years, but 1759 is known as the year of miracles that the war shifted in favor of the British. And by 1780, it's kind of like, I'm sorry, 1760, it's kind of like, sort of like the mopping up period of the war in the Americas. Also, 1760 is an important year too, because that is when a new king uh, is um, coronated you're very familiar with this gentleman. His name is King George III. Very good. Nice work, Hunter. So, George III will come in in 1760. The war will kind of wrap up around 1761, 1762, 1763. Uh, the Treaty of Paris will be hammered out. Here is the great commoner, William Pitt, Prime Minister. And then on the right there, there is the General James Wolfe. This is the famous portrait that we've, or not portrait, but uh, painting of the uh, Battle of the Plains of Abraham, the Battle of uh, Quebec, um, the death of General James Wolfe by Benjamin West. This is a very famous piece of colonial art um, from 1770. James Wolfe there in the center. So let's talk a little bit about the Treaty of Paris. This is the Treaty of Paris, 1763. Obviously, I don't want that, you to confuse that with the one that occurs 20 years later that will end the American Revolution. Um, and do keep in mind, I'm sure you remember this from last year, there are a number of different treaties of Paris. Um, so what are the terms of this treaty? France is kicked out of North America. This meant that Britain will control most Canadian provinces that had previously been controlled by France from the St. Lawrence all the way to the Great Lakes. Um, the Mississippi River Valley 
and the Ohio River Valley will fall into the hands of the British. The Louisiana Territory will fall in the hands of Spain. Florida is a bit up for dispute. Um, it's technically supposed to end up in British hands, but it's pretty much still remains under Spanish control. We'll talk about how Florida, the Florida issue, and how that's resolved later in the new nation, um, later in the semester. We also want to take a look at um, other lands that are gained. Uh, the chain of the British Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, uh, Jamaica, a lot of the Caribbean islands will, want, will, may, will remain in British control. Spain will get Cuba. Spain will get uh, the Dominican. France will get Haiti. And um, this will sort of lead to the British becoming like the world naval power um, at this period of time. Do keep in mind though that this sets in motion or sets the tone for grandson of Louis XIV, the Sun King, Louis XVI, to be willing to back the Americans uh, and the Patriots in seeking revenge on the losses that his grandfather had as a result of the French and Indian War through this term through these terms of the Treaty of Paris. So we'll talk more about that uh, in Lesson 6 and in Lesson 7. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with Louis XVI. Um, he is the guy that does not meet a so happy end uh, or very, a very tragic end at the hands of uh, Robespierre and the Jacobins um, during the French Revolution. Yeah, sees the uh, um, a trip to the guillotine. Um, so... Here we have, we'll just come back over the map. Um, if you see everything that's in like light, like sort of Carolina-ish blue, almost like a purple, uh, all that now is under British control. So you're looking at uh, all the Canadian land that had previously been controlled and the Ohio River Valley land and Mississippi River Valley land that had been controlled by the French. Louisiana will wind up in the hands of Spain, which it will later be ceded back to, to um, France. Cuba to Spain. Britain will gain uh, Honduras. There will also be a British claim in Central America to Belize. You have Jamaica, which they had previously gained. This is the British Bahamas and Virgin Islands. Um, so we've got Haiti. Santa Domingo uh, under the control of the French, uh, Dominican under the control of the Spanish, and then let's go back up here. Do you see what I was talking about? This whole area of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Cabot Strait, and the St. Lawrence Seaway, all that now under British control. Louisbourg, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, that entire area. We good on the map? Did anybody need me to explain any of those areas? Yeah, Jill. It's not completely gone. They will. They will. We'll talk. We'll talk about how they regain some control of lands as a result of the American Revolution. Yeah, good question. We'll get there. Um, another thing that happens as a result of the Treaty of Paris too, are you all familiar with the Acadians that we talked about earlier in the lesson? That's the Catholics. They're going to be pushed out of, uh, out of um, Nova Scotia and parts of Newfoundland and um, French Canada. And a lot of them will actually perish on their journey to the south. They will wind up in um, Louisiana territory. So are we familiar, familiar with Cajun Creole culture? Their, their roots are Acadian um, Catholics. Okay, 
let's talk a little bit about how this war sets the tone for what will become the American Revolution. The colonists come out of this a bit restless um, and uh, quite confident. So they now have war experience. This war experience builds camaraderie. It brings them together. The victory in the war develops a great deal of confidence um, and sort of what we would call esprit de corps. Um, the myth of British uh, invincibility had been shattered because they had served alongside the British and seen some pretty rough uh, defeat in the first years of the war. Quartering of British troops and the tension between British officers and colonial soldiers was a was a major issue because essentially uh, British soldiers could move into colonial homes and you had to house them, feed them, colonial jobs, they were competing for jobs in urban centers. Um, and another factor that's going to be controversial is colonial women. You have to understand that the largest generation at this period of time was very young. They were like, you know, basically pretty much about between, somewhere between your age and my age. So that becomes a, a important factor because when you increase your availability of eligible bachelors who might have um, sort of political high-born family connections and wealth, um, that could create a problem for young colonial suitors um, at home trying to compete against British soldiers that might be trying to court colonial women. Uh, colo uh, th this is an officer problem, and this is, I think, a pivotal moment in American history, and that's that the British refused to recognize American officers above the rank of colonel. So think of how different things may have been if the British would have said, you know what, you all serve bravely, and we want to promote guys like Washington to uh, regular army off, uh, regular army officers, and you're not militia, you're a regular British general. The, the uh, revolutionary cause might have been dead in the water because they might not have had the military leadership that they actually needed to to um, serve and, and start a revolution. So Washington's not able to ra rise above the rank of colonel um, in the Virginia militia. Um, a lot of the colonists see themselves as like more hardworking. They had a, a more of a, an ax to grind. They were defending their own land. Um, they were fighting for a more just cause and that the British regular soldiers were merely mercenaries sent over to aid them, not, they, they weren't soldiers that had any um, real cause to fight other than monetarily. Does that make sense? Um, another issue here is that the, the smuggling issue arises again. The idea of like secret trade with enemy enemies um, going against the mother country, that's gonna lead to that the string of more navigation laws to come talk a little bit more about these navigation laws uh, in the post-war era. British debt skyrockets, so that's going to um, lead to taxes that are going to be levied, and those taxes are going to be a major cause for the American Revolution. And then another thing I want to talk about is just cultural. Um, these folks fighting together makes them realize that like they're not as different as they thought they were like a Virginian versus a Massachusetts man. Yeah, they might have a different Protestant upbringing, but they speak the same language, they're developing the same traditions, they have the same ideals, they've, both, they've been impacted by the events of the Great Awakening, they've been impacted by the ideas of the Enlightenment, but they've also been impacted by the, the sheer, um, like the grit, the grit of trying to survive in colonial America. That's, um, that's part of this that sort of breaks down the barriers of disunity. So even though we can see the Albany Plan of Union as being one that didn't necessarily succeed, um, there are 
like larger leftover uh, seeds of unity that come out of this war. Um, and that's why, you know, we've got the join or die um, propaganda that I've posted up here to, to keep that in mind because that piece of propaganda, the join or die propaganda, is going to carry on with these colonial militiamen um, in being united going into the American Revolution. And a lot of these military leaders that are going to join the Patriot cause, they cut their teeth and got training and got experience in the French and Indian War. Sure. Um, so we've got, uh, we got the war's aftermath. Um, France is being pushed out, as we discussed before. Um, and the colonists are thinking, you know what? We can run freely. We can move out, out into the back country um, all as well. We can go out and settle, and there will not be any, um, any recourse. Well, they are met with a enemy that they had fought against during the French and Indian War, and that enemy are the native tribes that had formed together against them during the French and Indian War. So some of those tribes would include the Ottawa, the Miami, the Delaware, the Shawnee, um, the uh, Potawatomi. Those are just a that's just a list a few of the of the key tribes um, that are going to sort of want the colonists to stay on their side of the Appalachian Mountains. What what will occur is a group of companies that are established. They're basically like joint stock companies that will be established to send settlers out into this new territory of the Ohio River Valley. Like one famous company was known as the Transylvania Company, the Trans Woods, all right? It had nothing to do with, uh, you know, Dracula. It had everything to do with people going out into the Kentucky Territory. Do you all know what the translation of Kentucky is? No. It's, uh, no. It's Great Meadow. Um, it's the Shawnee word for Great Meadow. So we already know that Kentucky was controlled mostly by the Shawnee tribe. Well, a guy that you're all very familiar with is going to be one of the leaders of the Transylvania Company. How many people have heard of Daniel Boone in here? Okay. Daniel Boone served in the French and Indian War, uh, served, at, served as a leader of these hunting parties, served as a leader of these settlement parties, will end up in the American Revolution as well, serves as a, a um, congressman in the Virginia General Assembly. Um, so again, uh, you know, people want to get out into this territory and settle, and the colonists start saying, this is the reason we fought. We fought to be able to settle in this territory. Well, there is a commander-in-chief in charge of North America. His name is Jeffrey Amherst. And Amherst is, is fine with the colonists going out to settle, but what he's not fine with is continuing to pay tribute to these Native American chiefs, especially those who had sided with the French in the French and Indian War. So, Amherst, as commander-in-chief in North America, cuts off this uh, uh, form of tribute and trade. And in response, the most powerful chief of those allied tribes, uh, Chief Pontiac of the Ottawa, develops a confederation and just launches a series of attacks um, in and around the Ohio River Valley. So we're talking basically like Detroit, the siege of Fort Detroit, smaller forts throughout the Mississippi River Valley, Ohio River Valley. And I mean, we're talking about attacks that even make their way into the, um, attacks that make their way into the, the Western Pennsylvania and the Lehigh Valley. This directly relates to a group we've already learned about. Remember the Paxton Boys. They're connected with, with the, with Chief Pontiac's war. So Amherst decides to like weed those Delaware type 
tactics where they're going to search and destroy any, you know, scorched earth style tactics. And then Amherst takes it a step further and starts a really twisted tradition that American military commanders will continue with Native American tribes into the new nation. And that is handing over to Native people who are cold and starving blankets infested with smallpox. So they spread, what those commanders do is start spreading a smallpox epidemic among the Ottawa Confederation, and the disease is going to be a major um, weapon against this uprising, and, and between disease and warfare, it will crush the Ottawa. Another reason that the Ottawa uh, Confederation is crushed is because a big part of the tribute that Amherst had cut off was the, re the receiving of weapons, okay? Do you guys have any questions about Amherst or Pontiac? So here we have Amherst on the left, Pontiac on the right. Do you guys, this is uh, the, the, the formation of the Confederation over here. Do you all remember what um, Pontiac's holding in his hand there? We talked about it with the Iroquois Confederation. I mentioned it with the with the Wampanoag Confederation with King Philip's War. It's a it's a belt. Yes, it is a belt. It's 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 more important than a belt though. It tells a story. It's a beaded belt that has a name. Called a wampum. Okay, this wampum belt is a sign of their confederation, right? And remember, the wampum belt, the use of a wampum belt, told a story, whether it be of military alliance or whether it be of political, you know, set of political laws or rules that the tribe, bless you, that the tribe uh, followed through with. So, in response to Pontiac's war. The new king of England, George III, is not interested in continuing to pay amounting debt for colonial wars. So what will occur is a proclamation. I want everyone to take note of this. It will be on the midterm. Okay? Please take note of the proclamation of 1763. The reason that this is important, it is the first step, the first domino set up to be knocked over to start the American Revolution. Because a, a chain of forts and a line will be drawn through the eastern divide of the Appalachian Mountains. And no settlers are to move west of the divide. Well, what is, that creates problems, because guess what? There are already people that are settled west of the divide, and there are people that want to settle west of the divide, and they certainly don't want George III or any other colonial official telling them where, and where, when, and how they are going to settle in land that they fought to obtain. So this is the, the proclamation of... 1763 is an early example of how the British are going to set themselves up for a revolution. That's a big reason. I mean, it has a lot to do with it. Yes. All right. So we're going to take a look at that map. And it's like sort of like an out of bounds line. Um, again, a lot of people were defiant of this. One of those people was the guy we just talked about, Daniel Boone. He said, I don't care about your proclamation. I'm going to settle people less. I'm going to continue to hunt. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'll continue to fight Shaw and need be, which he did. Okay? Furthermore, you've got groups of people moving west through that that really interesting geographic area where North Carolina, Virginia, 
Tennessee, Kentucky, down, down in that area where it all kind of comes together. There's a specific geographic feature that was created by Meteor that allows you to pass through Appalachia. Does anybody know what it's called? The Meteor Passage. That's it. It's called the Cumberland Gap. The Cumberland Gap allowed people to get through Appalachia. Did you guys say it over there? Nice, good job. Hold on. All right. So, note, this is an early cause of the American Revolution. Okay, so, we have our proclamation line. And another part of this story that I want to share with you, you guys need to keep in mind, if British soldiers are supposed to uh, man the proclamation for it, are they going to want to be on the border of, oh, say, um, present-day uh, Allegheny County, Virginia, my stomping grounds where I'm born and raised, and present-day Greenbrier or Pocahontas County, Virginia? Or are they going to want to be down in Norfolk or maybe in Philadelphia or Boston? You know, they're going to want to be where the action is. They're not going to be one of, they're not necessarily going to want to be out in a desolate Appalachian fort where they might face what problems? Starvation, diseases, exposure to the elements, but who else do they have to deal with out there? Native Americans, right? This is an area of hostile natives that would not, that the British might not want to tangle with. The Cherokee, Shawnee, um, and there's a Cherokee uprising we'll talk about a bit later. So let's talk about some of the deep roots of the revolution. I'm kind of taking one from Skip Gates' book, the guy that we talked about earlier, professor from Harvard, who talks about the fact that the American Rev Revolution really begins with Jamestown, if we think about it, because they risk everything to roll the dice to, to live 3,000 miles away from home. And even though this war lasted eight to nine years, ironically, the Seven Years' War, as it was called, there is a sense of independence that had started um, during the colonial period, and we talked about these seedlings of revolution. Bacon's Rebellion, Lee Slayer's Rebellion, the Boston Revolt um, are, are, you know, to mention a few. The trip took six to eight weeks, right? Colonial governors were either appointed or voted upon. Um, survivors that made it in colonial America had a physical and spiritual separation from Europe. Colonists started to have fundamentally different points of view on how to govern themselves. And colonists following the French and Indian War started to believe themselves to be, you know, more, a more independent people. And where does that grow? It grows in colonial legislatures like the Virginia House of Burgesses formed in 1619. This is a good place uh, for us to pump the brakes today. The mercantilism, remember that this also has its roots um, in the American Revolution. The 13 colonies, with the exception of Georgia, the other 12, had been established by joint stock companies, religious groups, land speculate, speculators, or noble proprietors. Only Georgia had been formally established by the crown as a buffer colony. The, Brit the British embraced mercantilism, meaning their colonies produced natural resources, and they in turn produced finished products. So England's wealth is amassed on gold, silver, commodities, and the slave trade. To amass gold and silver, they have to export more than they import. So this is a lopsided balance of trade, and this is why they don't want their colonies trading with their competition or trading with their enemies. Countries with colonies had a major advantage because they could gain a large supply of raw materials, wealth, supply, and they controlled the market for selling their manufactured goods. They also set in force laws that limited colonial production of finished products. There's only really one 
major finished product that the colonies produce on a large scale. That's a really good guess, but keep in mind tobacco, even though finished, is still you know an agricultural product. We're talking about a finished product from start to finish, produced, and then sold. It involved, it involved, so Quinn, you, there are lumber mills. So you are, Quinn's actually not wrong. There are lumber mills, obviously there are tobacco plantations or sugar plantations. All that stuff is what we would call refined, but Jalen brings up a, a hint for you. This particular manufactured good required a great deal of sugar. Rum production. Very good. Rum production. So producing booze was one of the only manufactured goods. And again, we talk, we've already talked a bit about al uh, alcohol and spirit manufacturing. Um, you know, rum was produced on a large scale. Whiskey becomes produced on a large scale. Whiskey is kind of a tough one, though, because whiskey is not sold on... Whiskey is produced by pretty much anybody that wants to use it as a commodity. Like the largest whiskey producer in the colonies was George Washington. Um, so people produced whiskey to barter with, okay? So um, two of the main exports for, for England were tobacco and sugar. The mercantile system also perpetuated the colonial slave labor and promoted the transatlantic slave trade. And that led to labor for faster returns and the sale of slaves. So here we have colonial mercantilism. This is your key for tobacco, rice, wheat, hides, fish, corn, indigo, rum, lumber, shipbuilding, and naval stores. A lot of these naval stores would be like rope production. And that also leads to hemp production. Um, so, I got a, a handy dandy little graphic organizer here for you for mercantilism, the British-French rivalry with the French and Indian War, Spanish colonial system, mid-century, mid-18th century wars like Queen Anne's War, King George's War, um, the American War for Independence, which this is a cause, and then the African slave trade, which this system perpetuated. And that is a good place for us to stop. Question? You sure can. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Any other questions? All right.